Uh, welcome back. Um, so now we are going to quickly um, uh, announce the uh, paper awards and ask the authors who are here to come up and get their certificates. And then we'll have two talks by the paper awardees. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'd like to invite for best research paper the authors of Alexandria on the stage. Thank you. Uh, next, for the uh, best application paper, I'd like to invite uh, people from Normco on the stage. And for the last one, we had uh, we spent a lot of time deliberating. There were really amazing posters, uh, but finally we decided on uh, applying citizen science to gene drug uh, disease relation extraction from biomedical abstracts. Uh, can we invite the authors to be on stage? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I'll invite the authors of Alexandria to come up and uh, present their paper. Um, I'd like to thank the gold sponsors again for the paper awards. Um, and yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to receive this award. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, Alexandria. Um, and my name is John Guyver. Um, so we start off by asking the question, what tasks do we need to do automatically uh, to do automated knowledge-based construction? Well, certainly we need to uh, be able to extract facts. We need to discover entities. But to, do, to be fully automated, uh, we also need to be able to discover the, entity, the schema of an entity type. Uh, so if we start with this completely blank slate, of no schema, uh, then we have no labels, and therefore we have to take an unsupervised approach. So Alexandria uh, takes a probabilistic uh, modeling approach. Uh, so we define a generative model, and this model goes from knowledge base to text. And moreover, we define a single holistic model so that we can address all the tasks that we talked about on the previous slide in a consistent manner. So defining such a model is uh, a very challenging task. Right? Uh, first of all, the, the variables in this model are complex. So variables that represent uh, entities, such as people or places, uh, are structured objects consist consisting of strongly typed properties. Uh, we want to be able to uh, model uh, properties whose values are collections or whose values are uh, hierarchical data. Uh, and of course, we need uh, uh, string variables, text variables in our model. Now, in addition to this, we need to be able to um, maintain uncertainty in our model. So we're going to be learning from the entire web. Uh, and there's ambiguity, there's incompleteness, there's noise, and so on. So we want to be able to uh, represent uncertainty in each of these complex variable types. So we need distribution types over each of these variable types. Um, and we need to uh, do computation in the presence of that uncertainty. Right? So for example, if we're doing a computation uh, uh, that involves strings, such as formatting or concatenation, uh, and those strings are uncertain, we need to propagate that uncertainty uh, through the model. Uh, if we're doing the poly if we're considering the polymorphic mapping from um, uh, sort of the complex types in which our knowledge is stored to uh, 
uh, as, uh, the representation as a string, uh, then we need to maintain that uncertainty under those mappings. So this complexity uh, sort of uh, really uh, brings us to using a probabilistic program. We wanted to find our probabilistic model as a program. So here's a simple example of a probabilistic program, just uh, illustrative. Uh, so it looks like an ordinary program, except here we see uh, in this first line we have this keyword random, and this allows us to specify a random variable. Uh, so here we have a random variable name. Uh, it derives from a prior distribution over all capitalized strings. Uh, and the string on the left-hand side says the value type is string, but in fact it's a random variable. Uh, whose domain is, uh, is, is, uh, is the domain of strings. Uh, the next line says, uh, let's uh, define a random variable called date. Uh, that date comes from distribution over dates. Uh, here we have a date format. Now, this is a prior for this um, uh, date format, and this simple example is just a choice of two different uh, formats, whether we do day month first or month day. Uh, and then we can apply that format uh, to uh, the date, uh, to convert the date into a string. Uh, and that date string is also a random variable, right? because it derives from random variables. Uh, here we define a template random variable. So in this context, a template is a string with placeholders in which we can put property strings. Uh, and then we can apply that template. We can slot in our values. Uh, and now we have a piece of text. So this is shows a very simple generative process from a, a name variable and a date variable to a piece of text. Okay, so now the promise of probabilistic programming, programming is that you can define a model in this way, uh, and then you can observe some of the random variables, and then you can query the model for the uh, values of the other random variables and get the posterior distributions for those unobserved variables. Uh, and Behind the scenes, a standard inference algorithm is used to calculate those posteriors, an algorithm like uh, belief propagation or expectation propagation. So uh, we could, for example, observe the text, Fred was born on 5663. And we're observing here the text, the variable called text. OK, so to just get some insight into the inference, uh, we'll revisualize the uh, probabilistic program as a factor graph. Uh, and here, the ovals are the variables, and the black boxes correspond to the uh, functions in the program, say how the variables fit together. Uh, so we observe the text. Uh, Fred was born on 5663. Uh, and then the inference algorithm propagates messages uh, th throughout the, um, uh, the graph. And um, once it's, it's converged, we can read off posterior distributions from, uh, from the graph. So here are the posterior distributions, and what we see is that uh, from that certain string, Fred was born on 5663, uh, actually the date variable is ambiguous. There's uncertainty there because of the uh, ambiguity arising from uh, the formats. Uh, so um, I sort of somewhat glibly said that um, you know, we, the, this uh, standard inference algorithm is used uh, uh, behind the scenes, which is a message passing algorithm. Uh, but in fact, we, we need to do these calculations, these message calculations, and we use info.net um, to do the string, uh, to do um, inference over strings, uh, and we've extended info.net to be able to do inference over the, the types uh, of the variables in our knowledge representation. So um, here's the same model, but now we have a different uh, pattern of observations. So here we observe name and template, we can do inference in this model uh, just as we did before. Uh, and then if we uh, ask uh, what's the value of text in the presence of these observations, we see that the text variable has an uncertain value. Uh, and that uncertainty comes from the uncertainty in the date, which we haven't observed. Right, so we looked at a very simple example. So we can uh, look at a more realistic uh, probabilistic program. And this is part of the Alexandria probabilistic program. So here we have an entity random variable, which is drawn from a distribution over entities. Uh, let's assume for now we have a schema. So we have a bunch of properties represented by the schema. Uh, we can pick uh, a value from uh, a set of, conflict of conflicting values. Uh, we can pick a format that now comes from a, a prior that is dependent on the property type. 
uh, and then we can apply that format to get property strengths. So now this is a generative model that's taken an entity in our knowledge base, turned it into property strings. We can now apply a template, and then we can add text at the start and at the end, uh, and now we have a piece of text that we might see on the web. Right? So to run inference in this model, we then hook up the entire internet, uh, the entire web into uh, as observation uh, for our model. So uh, we've talked about properties having types. So the Alexandria type system um, is uh, a, a small set of types in which we build the knowledge uh, for different types of entities. Uh, so here you see uh, the first column you can think of as being the sort of type family. Now the types in Alexandria are parameterized. So for example, you look at the quantity type is parameterized by a unit family, and you can specify a mean variance for the values of this quantity. Uh, if you look at the code type, I uh, think code, you can think zip code or ISBN or GUID or something like that. Uh, that's parameterized by a pattern, a regular expression type pattern. Um, and so that's the type system. Now, unlike a, an ordinary type system, a stochastic type system like we have in Alexandria, we also need to be able to describe uncertainty. So we need to specify distribution type that represents the uncertainty in that uh, value. Uh, we need to be able to specify a prior, and the type of that prior is the type of the distribution type. So we have distribution over strings, over objects, over dates, and so on. Uh, we, we need a format prior, and the format prior is a string distribution, which has what formats are available for this type. And then we need a way to take formats and values, uh, both uncertain, and convert them into uncertain text. So that's the type system. Now, we talked about wanting to learn a schema. So this is the part of the um, Alexandria model that um, generates a schema. So um, we, can, uh, we define this uh, probabilistic program in which now the number of properties in the schema is a random variable. Um, and for each such property, we draw a type prior. And the type prior, you can think of as one of the rows in that table. Okay? And uh, then, once we have a row in the table, we want to pick a parameterization. So, uh, so that's this, this line of the probabilistic program. And then we, we want a name for our property. Uh, and there may be several different ways of referring to the property. So date of birth, birthday, birth date, et cetera. Uh, so we have a generative model for the names uh, that comes from some name prior. So uh, that's the uh, probabilistic program for generating a schema. So now let's look at inference in that, in that program. Well, let's fix attention on the code type. Uh, so think zip code. Um, so uh, the code type has a model. The model says how to go from the parameter of the type, pattern, okay, which we don't know. Uh, to values and then to strings. We can then observe a whole bunch of text. So here we're actually observing UK uh, postcodes. Um, and we can run inference this model in this model in, a, in, in, in the way I described before. Uh, and we get a posterior over patterns. Uh, and here if I, um, uh, I've, I've uh, written out the, um, I've enumerated the posterior distribution over patterns uh, in uh, order of probability. So there we've, we've done type inference on, on the parameter. Sorry, we've done type parameter inference. Um, we also want to know which row of the table our property actually is. So this is type inference. Uh, so here we see on the left-hand side in the dash box, we see um, uh, the code type that we looked at on the previous slide. We have date type. We have all the other Alexandria types. And these are gated. Uh, by random variable type, which is the row in the table. And we can run inference in this gated model uh, and um, uh, then uh, uh, obtain a distribution over, a posterior distribution over types. And we can pick the most probable type as our, um, the, the type of that property. So let's um, see how we can apply this to constructing uh, a, a knowledge base automatically. So we start with uh, a single name and just one label. And it happens to be Barack Obama's birth date, but we don't, we don't tell the system it's that. It's, so it's just one label. This is our entire training set. Okay, then we're going to 
in the experiment in this paper, we take 3,000 names, and that's our schema learning set, but we have no labels, no labels at all. Uh, and then we have a test set, and the test set is for evaluation only. So we, we have labels uh, that, that, that we use to evaluate the system. Okay, so earlier we saw we had one graphical model, and we could query it in different ways. One probabilistic program, we can query in different ways by different observation patterns. Uh, in the Alexandria model, that equates to being able to do different tasks, so fact extraction, schema learning, template learning, entity discovery, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, we uh, bootstrap um, our learning of schema by, first of all, um, searching for these, our training set strings on the entire web, and then we get a, a, a set of templates out. We do template learning. We can then use that template learning to extract facts for a small number of uh, our 3,000. Uh, and then we can snowball up, uh, alternating between template learning and fact extraction until we have um, that, that, those facts for uh, uh, the, uh, the entire 3,000. Uh, and once we have that, we have a lot of rich sources of information uh, for these entities. Uh, and then we can do uh, schema learning, and schema learning will give out lots and lots of properties and their names. Uh, and we just take the, 20, the top 20 properties in this, um, uh, in this example. So uh, once we have a schema, we can then do template learning, uh, strongly typed template learning on that schema. And then we can apply it to the test set and evaluate. So here are the results. So this is the schema learning results. And what I think is very important to remember when looking at this table, that this was all inferred. We didn't provide any information for this here. So we learned all these names on the left-hand column for these properties of people. We learned the Alexandria type. We inferred that. Uh, the third column is the number of um, entities out of the 3,000 for which we found that particular property. Uh, the fourth column is the number of web domains that were used to inform the schema learning. Uh, and the fifth column shows some alternative names that we uh, found for these properties. Uh, and then if we look at the uh, precisions, we find precisions for all our properties between 95 and 100 percent. Okay, And bear in mind, we just use that one label, that one date of birth, uh, to do this, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, so. Uh, I've talked about um, how we do automatic schema learning, uh, how we do uh, high precision fact extraction. Uh, so what's next? Well, first of all, we want to extend this out to uh, hundreds of entities. Uh, and this, this program's already underway. Um, the next step would be to uh, do um, automatic de-discovery of new entity types. Now, with that in place, that, that, that creates the uh, exciting uh, possibility then of uh, not just going from a single fact to uh, a bunch of facts about one entity type, but to organically grow a knowledge base, uh, recursively discovering types, schemas, entities, and facts, which I hope you'll find a, a very exciting prospect. OK, well, thank you very much. And, uh, well, Uh, what I'm going to do now, um, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, John, John Wynn. John Wynn is the, um, uh, the primary researcher and the visionary for Alexandria. He wasn't able to travel, uh, but we have him on audio here. Uh, John, are you there? Yep. Hello, everyone. Okay. <laughs> and John, uh, 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 John would have liked to have been here, but um, uh, he's here to answer questions. So. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, with the, um, the, the, the types such as the name type, um, as you said, for each type you have to specify a prior amongst other things. What does a prior for name for names look like? Is it, is it just a prior on general strings or is, is, there more deet, is there more granularity to the prior than that? Did you um, hear that, John? 
Yeah, I, I caught that. The question was, um, what do the prior over names look like? Um, and yes, it, it, it's generally speaking, it's a distribution over strings. Um, because, uh, you know, but, but, it, but it will be a structured distribution. So, for example, for a person's name, uh, we're not just looking at strings for the whole name. That would be decomposed into all the different parts of the name. So, it would be actually an uncertain object with a distribution over the string for the first name, middle name, last name, and so on. Thanks. Any other questions? Really inspiring work. I wanted to ask what kind of inference algorithm are you using behind the scenes? You mentioned it's very fast. Is it uh, which, which type is it? The, the question was what's the inverse algorithm? Inference algorithm, yes. Um, so, uh, as sort of John described, um, the algorithm is uh, expectation propagation, or in, in many cases it reduces to belief propagation. So we simply take the program, um, automatically construct the, the factor graph, and then run, run belief propagation. And the, and the nice thing about that is that it's defined in all directions, so we can run it forward, we can run it backward, we can run it um, for any uh, arbitrary configuration of observed variables or un, uh, unobserved variables. Uh, and that's, I think, a very powerful approach here. So we haven't really had to design an algorithm. We just have to design a model from the probabilistic program, and then the algorithm is, is sort of automatically defined then given that. It's maybe time for one more question. Hey John, this is Laura Deeds. Great to hear from you. Um, I have one question. So this is, I'm really happy to see how Info.net developed in the last 10 years. I'm really super excited about this. I'm wondering how would this kind of like correlate with, you know, an old fashioned approach of using uh, inf Wikipedia info boxes to train a text extractor or all the more recent work on uh, common sense knowledge base extraction or open IE extraction. So I mean, it seems to be that there's like a common ground where one could maybe get some extra mileage out of, um, out of kind of like connecting these different sources. And I mean, while I like the purity of the approach of where well, we just train ourselves how to understand language, I think maybe there are a couple of things like how to extract birth dates that maybe we don't have to learn from scratch, but maybe we can sort of like we know already how to do that. We can spend the data that we have on maybe other parts that we have not yet tacked down. Do you have any opinion on that? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch all of that. Can so, someone repeat? Okay, how do the approach of, how does your current approach of self-training everything from scratch um, connect to training yourself how to extract with Wikipedia info boxes and Wikipedia text? and uh, some of the open IE work or common sense knowledge, knowledge extraction. What's the common ground? Can we maybe do better than just training everything from scratch? Um, so I'm getting some echo, but I, mean, I, I heard something about which yeah, the info boxes and training on just that compared to what we're doing. Is, is that a, if I have to tackle that question? Um, I mean, this, this system is capable of uh, extracting information Wikipedia for us to model, but it's not because it's a brilliant probabilistic program. Uh, we're not needing to, to train it. We don't need to just put prior knowledge into the program, which actually means we can read a very broad set of websites, provided they're compatible with the assumptions of the program. And what we're finding is that that means that we can read across a, you know, a huge number of sites, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of sites, rather than just Wikipedia. Um, and in general, the other sort of nice thing about having an interpretable program is that where we see a failure, where we see a mismatch between uh, the assumptions in the program and the site, we can sort of debug it like we would a program. So rather than having to go and find some more training data to try and solve a, 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 an extraction error, we can sort of debug it, treat it like a bug, and, and determine whether we need to make a change to the program, make a change to the approximate input. Um, and, and generally, we can very, very precise and fix errors in, in a way that's quite unusual for a machine learning system. Okay, uh, let's thank both the Johns again. Yeah.
Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Bye. -bye. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dustin Wright. I'm a master's student at UC San Diego, and I'm really, really, really honored to be able to speak to you all today and really happy that we can share our work. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about our work on disease normalization for biomedical uh, knowledge-based construction. So just to give some background, the lab I work in is interested in microbiome research. And the field of the microbiome has been seeing an exponential increase in the number of publications per year. If you look at a graph, it's literally a hockey stick of, in terms of number of publications. So there's been a growing need in this field to have a consolidated source of information. It's uh, an easily uh, queryable, parsable, structured source of information. And our lab is interested in constructing a knowledge base from the microbiome literature. So types of uh, associations of interest are disease bacteria associations, uh, say numbers of E. coli in certain communities are associated with certain types of uh, diseases such as uh, Crohn's disease. Having this type of information in a consolidated resource will help clinicians, researchers, nutritionists in uh, advancing their research. The particular aspect of knowledge-based construction that we were interested in in this work was uh, entity normalization, specifically for disease entity types. So entity normalization, entity linking is essentially the task of mapping an entity mention found in text to a ground truth concept in an ontology or in a knowledge base. Uh, in our case, we're interested in uh, disease-related ontologies such as the CTT Medic Disease Dictionary. So we could have a sentence say, adherence invasive E. coli is a mucosa associated bacterium often found in CD. And we need to know, okay, is CD Crohn's disease, celiac disease, uh, based on the text and what other, other, whatever other sources of information features that we find useful. The previous state of the art on this task mostly focuses on uh, feature engineering and shallow learning techniques. Um, the two state-of-the-art methods uh, that we compare as baselines are DNORM and TAGR1, which both rely on TFIDF-based uh, um, features. So this is, there, it's incredibly useful for this type of uh, domain where there's just not a lot of labeled training data. So given this, our research questions were as follows. So we wanted to see how can recent advances in deep learning be applied to this domain, given that there's a strong lack of training data in this domain. Um, there have been attempts to use deep nets on this problem up to this point using convolutional nets and uh, semantic features using word embeddings, but up to this point, um, no deep learning method had been able to achieve uh, better than the TFIDF-based uh, baselines. The next question we were interested in is what aspects of language could be useful for the problem of disease entity normalization? So what are the necessary linguistic components that we could use within a, a neural framework um, to be able to solve this problem. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to look at, given this lack of training data, what sources of data augmentation could be useful uh, using a neural model? So to answer these questions, we took a two-fold approach for entity normalization. Uh, we essentially looked at two different sources of features. So we, we were looking at semantic features using uh, the entity mentioned text. So this consists of word embeddings and a compositional phrase model. And then we were ultra also interested in using context in some fashion. So the way that we use context is actually by trying to model coherence. So instead of looking at local context of a phrase, we're looking at uh, learning to predict a coherent set of diseases within a document. Uh, and so the way that we model this is with a uh, recurrent net. 
uh, getting a little bit deeper. So the way that we, the architecture of our network is as follows. So we start with entity mentions that we find in text within a document. We extract mentions. We get, uh, we tokenize the text, we clean it, we get word embeddings for each of the tokens within a mention. Uh, we then compose a vector representation of a mention uh, to get a single, single representation for, for each mention within a document. Uh, we then pass these through a coherence model to learn representations of the mentions based on the surrounding mentions. And then we project these into a concept embedding space as opposed to using a softmax classifier to be able to predict what is the, the correct concept for each mention. So I'll get a little bit deeper now and, and explain just those components. So for our phrase model, we were actually inspired by Felix Hill's work in 2016, where he essentially showed that uh, simple summation of word embeddings, you can actually achieve good performance for sentence representations. So we decided to model our, uh, our phrase model this way. So essentially the way it works is we have word embeddings, and we sum them, and then pass them to a linear projection to get a single vector representation for, for each mention. The entity mentions are then passed through a, a bidirectional GRU network. So instead of um, using, say, like loopy belief propagation and modeling the joint probability of all of the mentions in the document, we decided to see if we could use this simplified way of, of modeling coherence by using a GRU to learn representations of a mention based on the surrounding mentions. Um, so so the, that, the reason why we model is, is to have that simplification. All right, and then finally, the vector representation based on coherence, as well as the representation from the mention model, are projected into a concept embedding space. So, so we actually learn an individual representation for every concept, and what this gets us is we can then uh, bake into the tag space knowledge from the ontology. So we can initialize this concept embedding space using the preferred names that come from our, our ontology uh, to have a good initial representation and help get around the data sparsity problem with, with most of the data sets in this domain. Um, so then the, the predicted concept that we, we use is actually a learned average of the closest points to the phrase representation and the coherence representation for each mention. In terms of how we train this model, so, so since we're using uh, distance metric as our, as our way of uh, performing prediction, we have to use uh, some sort of ranking objective. So we, we use this lossless triplet loss, which is essentially a, a max margin objective. But instead of just using the points themselves, what we first do is we pass them through sigmoid. And so what this does is it restricts the points to like a unit hypercube. So the points are restricted between a vector of all zeros, vector of all ones. And essentially what this does is that the maximum distance between points in the space is then the square root of the dimensionality. So that if we set the margin to the square root of D, then we can essentially, when we have zero loss, it means that the distance between a negative example and our prediction is as far in that space as possible, and the distance between the prediction and the uh, positive example is, is zero, so they're the same point. So essentially zero loss means the margin is maximized. All right, and then for, for inference, we do the same thing. We, we pick the closest point in that space after passing the embeddings through a, a sigmoid. Uh, so, as I said before, and seems to be a theme throughout this conference, that within this domain of scientific literature and biomedical, biomedical science, there's just, there's not a lot of training data. It's very hard to label these data sets because it requires domain expertise. Um, so it, it becomes more expensive than general domain data sets. So what we do is we, we have to augment our data set with external knowledge. So we, we essentially get two different sources of uh, external data both coming from the same data set. So we use the BioASQ data set, which is a semantic indexing corpus. Basically, it's sets of documents, sets of abstracts, which aren't labeled at the mention level. They're labeled at the document level. Um, so we know that a particular concept appears within a document. We just don't know where. So the first set of uh, external data that we get is uh, from distance supervision. So we use the names within the concept ontology, and we find the particular mentions which appear in the document, and we label them using their preferred names and synonyms coming from the ontology. The second way that we use this data set is we generate synthetic examples. So we can get co-occurrence statistics between the, the mentions, uh, or between the concepts which you know appear within documents, and then we can generate, randomly generate uh, new sets of coherent, what 
based on the co-occurrence statistics, coherent sets of concepts using the names from the ontology. All right, so those are the two ways we get external data. How that represents itself in our data sets is as follows. So we use uh, the NCBI disease corpus and the biocreative chemical disease relation corpus, which are kind of the standard benchmarks for this task. Uh, you can see that inherently there's, there's not very much data in these data sets. The NCBI disease corpus has less than 1,000 abstracts and only seven, less than 7,000 annotations. And biocreative is you know, 1,500 abstracts, less than 13,000 annotations. So it's very hard to train uh, neural networks using these, these data sets. But with our distance supervision, we're able to, to bump up the number of abstracts we have by, by several thousand and get you know, 100,000, 100, 120,000 extra annotations about for, for both, both data sets, right? So moving on to evaluation, we use micro F1 and accuracy, which are kind of the standard evaluation metrics for this task. So essentially saying, what concepts can we recognize within a document, as well as given a perfect tagger, how many of these uh, uh, perfect, perfectly tagged mentions do we classify correctly? All right, but one issue that we have with, one issue with accuracy is that it treats all errors the same, whereas we have this concept ontology, so we have some idea of uh, prediction quality based on how far they are within the ontology. Um, so we, we use this normalized LCA distance to get a kind of a, a measure of prediction quality. So the way it works is we could have a ground truth concept of eye abnormalities, and one predictor could predict uh, that the concept is Crohn's disease. Within the CTD dictionary, the only uh, disease in common between these two diseases is disease. So essentially the only thing they have in common is that they're both diseases, but nothing else in terms of the disease. Predictor 2, on the other hand, could predict congenital abnormalities, which is one of the parents of eye abnormalities. So we have some way of saying, okay, so this is a much more similar disease to eye abnormalities than Crohn's disease, so this is a, a less egregious error. Um, in terms of uh, how far it is from the, the ground truth disease. All right, and then finally we look at uh, efficiency. So how efficiently can we train these models given the same amount of data, how, how long does it take tr to train the model? So let's look at some numbers. Uh, so for micro F1 on NCBI disease corpus, uh, we, we get much better precision, we get slightly better recall, and so overall we get about a 4% improvement in terms of F1 score. So on the NCBI disease corpus, our normalizer, uh, using tags that come from, from tagger one, we can get uh, improvements in terms of F1. We didn't see quite as many gains on biocreative, so we, we still see improvements in terms of precision, but for, for recall, we see a, a strong dip, so we get about 0.003 uh, F1 under uh, tagger one on biocreative. And so the, the reason for this, we, we think, is because we have this very highly precise set of distantly supervised examples, and this distance supervision is necessary for, for this model to be able to, to perform well on these tasks. Whereas biocreative has a much more diverse set of concepts, so it's, we, having higher recall is, is necessary to perform well on this, on that data set. So one potential way we could mitigate this is to have perhaps better distance supervision that's less precise, not just using names in the ontology and doing uh, string matching that way. So for accuracy, it's a similar story. We perform slightly better on NCBDI diseases, on the NCBDI, NCBI disease corpus, and slightly worse on the biocreative disease corpus. So it's a, it's a sim similar situation. There's just more diversity in the biocreative corpus, and we have very precise distance supervision. Um, however, we, so the baseline models use abbreviation resolution, so we, we use that for uh, test data for our normal evaluation. We, we tested by removing abbreviation resolution to see how, how the, the models re respond to having to predict the concepts for abbreviations, and we saw that we had improvements on both data sets when we remove abbreviation resolution, so we thought that was an encouraging result. All right, and then our measure of prediction quality, our normalized LCA distance, um, we saw improvements on both data sets, so in this case, lower is better. Um, and so for both data sets, we saw that we, we have higher prediction quality on average than the baseline models. All right, and then finally, for efficiency, we saw that uh, our models were much more efficient to train. Um, uh, we saw orders of magnitude 
less time per uh, per epic for given different amounts of, of training data. So uh, we thought this was encouraging because we can essentially we have more capacity to train on more data more efficiently uh, than the baseline models. So part of this is because we, we actually, our, our modeling is very simple. So most of the performance for our model comes from the fact that we, we have all this distance supervision and so we can actually train more efficiently uh, on more data which is, is necessary for the model to perform well. So some final takeaways for our model. Uh, the, the big, one of the big takeaways is that very simple modeling of semantic features with the right amount of distance supervision is enough to get good performance in a neural, with a neural model on this task. So uh, a lot of the performance of this model comes from the, the, phrase represent, the phrase model having this concept embedding space which we can and initialize with information from the concept ontology and then having enough distance supervision coming from the ontology when we, when we train. Um, that, that gets a lot of the way for the performance of this model. Um, in addition, we, we have a higher prediction quality with our, our model, so we were encouraged by that result that potentially the, the types of errors that we get, on average, they're mostly parents and children of diseases for, for our model. Um, so we thought that was, that was an encouraging result. Uh, and then finally, the utility of coherence appears to be domain dependent. So we, we learn a weighted average of the predictions for uh, the coherence model and the, the entity phrase model. And we saw that on average it tends to favor, for diseases we tend to favor uh, using the phrases for the predict final prediction as opposed to coherence. Whereas we're, we've been doing uh, kind of ex an extension of this working on bacteria and we've been seeing that uh, potentially for bacteria, coherence is more important. So, so this is an ongoing area of investigation, so we're, we're still looking into coherence. All right, so finally I'd like to just thank the team. I wouldn't be able to do this without all the really intelligent, hardworking people that I work with. So, so thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that you might have now. So thank you. We have time for a question. Uh, thanks for the talk. So if I understood correctly, you were talking about um, a type of evaluation where you were taking into account um, uh, um, how similar two things were in the tree. Right. Uh, so if you pre predict a disease that's further away in the tree, you would get punished more. Mm -hmm. uh, did you think about trying to incorporate this into your loss function to improve the training mechanism? Yeah, we've thought about potentially as like a way, like a regularizer potentially like take into account the distance between like the prediction and the ground truth concept and then penalize based on how far they are from from the from the ground from the ground truth concept. So it's we've thought about it, we haven't tested it yet. Great, thanks. And let's thank Dustin again. Thanks.